Let's take our Bibles tonight and open together, please, to the book of 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 5. And before we get into the message, I just want to re- uh, kind of remind you, several of you have given money toward these beautiful poinsettias at the front of the sanctuary. Uh, you've, you've given in honor of a loved one, represent them, and their memory over the course of Christmas time. And if you've purchased one, and please don't forget to take it home with you tonight. Uh, this week, Lord willing... Uh, all the Christmas decorations here will be taken down, and uh, what is left here will be discarded. And so, uh, even if you did not, and you'd like one, come and get one. That way they're not all thrown away. What a waste that would be, right? And so, uh, let's take our Bibles tonight and turn to First Peter chapter number 5. And we come to the Word of God this evening, and, and just a, an encouraging passage of Scripture. I, I pray that God has helped you as much as he's helped me in our study uh, through this particular book of the Bible. and It's a short epistle. As a matter of fact, uh, Peter writes concerning the brevity of which uh, he wrote in, in, in verse number 12. Uh, but there's been many great and, and marvelous truths stated uh, that, that encourage our hearts through suffering uh, to live our lives expressly for the glory of God. And if you're able tonight, I invite you to stand with me as we end our reading here, beginning in verse 10. We'll read down through verse number 14, the final verse of this beloved epistle. The Bible says, But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. By Sylvanus, a, fellow, uh, a faithful brother unto you, as I supposed I have written briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God wherein ye stand. The church that is at Babylon, elect together with you, saluteth you, and so doth Marcus, my son. Greet ye one another with a kiss of charity. Peace be with all that are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Father, we thank you for the word of God tonight, and Lord, our prayer is that you would help us this evening, both know and apply the word of God to our hearts and lives. Lord, as we purpose to conclude this study this evening, Father, our prayer is that you would help us live appropriately, that you would help us take the truth that you've given, Lord, that we would, that you would help us make application of this truth in our lives so that it becomes more than just fact, but that it becomes practical, life-changing principles uh, as we purpose to follow you in obedience. And so, God, we pray that you lead us tonight, that you give us great clarity, give us help. Speak to us, we ask, and we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. If you're in the habit of marking things in your Bibles, I'd like to draw your attention to what the Word of God says in verse number 12. The Bible says, the true grace of God, wherein ye stand. The true grace of God, wherein ye stand. What does this mean? Of course, what is this grace? In order to understand, we know what true is. Uh, Jesus Christ is true. He is the truth. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, We know that in Him is found no fault. We also understand that everything God says is true. Thy word is true from from the very beginning. Uh, We understand that God's word is truth. Even Jesus Christ in the garden, the night he was betrayed, prayed to God the Father and saying in John chapter 17 and verse 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So we understand what is true. Jesus Christ is true. The word of God is true. God cannot lie. Furthermore, in in Titus chapter number 1, the the word of God confirms this, saying in verse number 2, in hope of eternal life that God, or which God that cannot lie, promised before the world began. You and I, we are, we have, we are following more than cunningly devised fables. Uh, we are following that which is true. And, and so what is it that is true? The Bible said, to, defines the grace of God as being true. What is this grace wherein we stand? Friends, to understand that salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. And it's true. Behold, the grace of God uh, that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. 
teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. What is this grace wherein we stand? The salvation in which our faith is anchored, sure, and steadfast, is not a lie. It's not some figment of your imagination. It's not some uh, mystical crutch upon which you lean uh, to get you through the hardships of life. I was talking with someone just this week, uh, a tragedy uh, unfolded in, in, in Lithopolis. And uh, it kind of, lot, a long story, we will neglect to go into a lot of this. But as I was on my way this week, I was riding in, in a patrol car, in the front seat, not in the back, um, and, a, and sharing a conversation with a dear friend of mine. And in light of all the horrific things that are on the news, we're exposed to some things firsthand, unavoidable. And I told him, I said, you know what? You know what helps me through things like this? It's it's my faith in Jesus Christ. I know that I never have to go through these things alone. I never have to see these things alone. I never, I'm never left alone ever. Jesus Christ will never leave you uh, uh, nor forsake you. He's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. And I, and I told him, I said, sometimes people use Christianity or, or faith in general as a crutch upon which they lean to get them through hardship. But understand that Jesus Christ is real. He's true. And he is life changing. And the Apostle Peter, as he writes, as he's concluding uh, these, these, uh, this, this great epistle, he's reminding everybody of what has just been stated. And really, I know we, we look back in verse number, um, in the first chapter, uh, to, in verse number, uh, was it verse number three, as being perhaps the, the key verse of this particular book? And where the Bible says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which hath, uh, according to His abundant mercy, hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We understand that that Christ is alive forevermore, but but we must never forget that it's true. Sometimes in the midst of great of great sadness, in the depths of despair. People will question, is it real? Is it true? And Peter's reassuring us once more that this grace, wherein we stand, is true. It's not a lie. It's real. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, For by grace are ye saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The word of God is true. God is, God is real. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth forth His handiwork. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. We under, no, but we know that God is true. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that we are without excuse. And God is true. Jesus Christ is the Lamb slain from the foundation of the earth. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It is real. It's true. Don't allow the hardships or circumstances of life to, to cause you to doubt the goodness and faithfulness of God. This is true. This grace is true. Look what it, the Bible says back in, in verse number 12. It says, The true grace of God, wherein ye stand. Speaking of our position... We are standing in this grace of God. We are standing, we are, in other words, we are possessors of so great salvation. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Look at what the Bible says in the book of Ephesians, please. In Ephesians chapter number 6, 
The Bible says in, uh, let's see, in verse number 10 of Ephesians chapter 6, the Bible says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. You and I, we stand in this grace of God. Don't don't shy away from it. Don't, don't, Don't flinch. Don't hesitate. Stand boldly. In your faith in Jesus Christ. It's a present possession. But it's a future hope as well. This lively hope. He speaks at length here, and as we look back in 1 Peter chapter 5, he speaks at length concerning the glory of God. It says in verse number 10, But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, What is this eternal glory? Heaven. His his very presence. In 1 John chapter 3, the Bible says this. It says, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew Him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when He shall appear... We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. Friends, you and I are the sons of God. And it is this grace, it is this promise that God has given that that anchors our hearts and that provides us hope and that gives us clarity and understanding even in the midst of great difficulty. God is faithful. God is true. God is real. Heaven is real. And you and I are not to be living for this world. We're not to be living in light of this world. We are to be living in light of the blessed promises of Jesus Christ and the inheritance that he has assured us of. You and I, we will one day be ushered into the very presence of God. On all the the troubles that this world provides us, and that we're inundated with, will quickly be forgotten in light of the goodness and grace, the splendor of our Savior's presence. But you know what this grace is? It's not just saving grace. But I'm thankful that God allows us to live for Him by this grace as well. You and I can live a life for God's glory. You and I can bring praise and honor to our Savior because we understand that in this this hard life, as a matter of fact, even Peter even says in verse number 10, notice, and it doesn't make sense to most of us, we think, you know, I'm going to, my wife and I, we were having a conversation and and she referenced a, a a Christian author, I don't remember her name, but she write. I guess this author, she write, and I've never read, read any of her books either, but I guess there's this author out there that, that, that uh, you know, writes these books, everything turns out in the end, everything is great, <laughs> whatever, right? <laughs> what fairy tale are you living in, right? Look what the Bible says in verse number 10. Not only has he called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, but notice what the Bible says in the following expression. It says, after that ye have, what? Suffered a while. Life is hard. It's difficult, isn't it? But this life is not all there is. You know, we can, we can take the hardships, can't we? We can roll with the punches. However, our fight is only as good as our faith. We know that that the hardships of life are 
are going to happen. Man, is a, man that is born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble. But we know that God is good. And that His grace is sufficient. And because God's grace is sufficient, these hardships, this suffering that, that I am called of God to endure in this life, will not determine my behavior. For as a child of God, I am determined to continue living my life by faith. As the Apostle Paul clearly stated, as he shared his testimony, he said, none of these things move me. I continue living my life for Jesus Christ. Look at what the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter number 12. As we're thankful that this grace saves, but we're also thankful that God's grace is sufficient. And as we live our lives, we, we must learn to, to rest in Him. Sometimes we come to the end of ourselves. And may I say for the Christian, for the child of God, that's exactly where we ought to be. I always want to live my life at the end of myself. Because when we come to the end of ourselves, that's where we learn to rely fully upon the Lord. The Bible tells us to have no confidence in the flesh. The Apostle Paul, he's writing, he's sharing his testimony here, and, and of course in, he's talking about his heavenly vision, and, and because he saw these great and, and unspeakable things, God gave him a thorn in the flesh. And the Bible says in verse number 7, he says, And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given, unto, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan sent to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. You know, we don't understand why, uh, why hardships come. We don't know the extent of Paul's thorn in the flesh. We don't know what it was. We know it was unenjoyable. We understand it was something that, that he needed victory over. And that God, it wasn't God's will to heal him. It wasn't God's will to remove that thorn in the flesh from his life, but that it was God's will to give him grace, sufficient grace to live through it, to live with it, to deal with it. Look what he says in response to Paul's prayer. He said unto me in verse number 9, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Friends, we understand that the grace of God is sufficient. We're thankful that God has saved us, but in the hardships of life, God gives us His grace to continue living for Him, and this grace is sufficient. No matter what the, the problem is, no matter how great it is, no matter the pain that ails you, God is able, God's grace is sufficient. But we also find that not only is God's grace sufficient, we also find that God's grace is effectual. Aren't you glad that God's grace actually works? <laughs> Have you ever tried something that didn't work? I've endured weeks of physical therapy on my back. And you know what? It didn't work. But you know what will work? God's grace. Because God's grace is effectual. God's grace works. Look at what the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2. In verse number 10. What does God's grace do? God's grace helps us live our lives for Him. Consider your life. Even as Paul said, he said, I am what I am by the grace of God. What does this mean? Well, in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, the Bible says, For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is, the, work, uh, it is uh, the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But in verse 10, the Bible says, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. This salvation that God, that, that God gives us, this grace wherein we stand, it's effectual in that it changes our lives. 
You and I, we were out living for ourselves. We were doing our own thing. All we like sheep have gone astray. Each of us have turned to our own way. And the Lord hath laid upon him the iniquity of us all. We were out doing our own thing, being our own person, contrary to God's will, contrary to God's plan, living for me. But the Lord saved me. And he made me new. And he gave me this new desire. This desire that I did not have before. This longing, this this drive to glorify and honor him. This grace of God, it's effectual, it works. It's sufficient, it's effectual, but it's also available. Aren't you glad that the grace of God is available? Look with me in the book of James tonight. In James chapter number 4. James chapter 4 and verse number 6. The Bible says, but he giveth more grace. God's grace is available to you. This grace wherein you stand, this salvation that God has given you, has now allowed you to live a life that can actually glorify and honor the Lord. But you need His grace. This God-given ability to do the right thing. And you know what? It's available to you. God says, My grace is sufficient. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So we, this, this grace that God gives works. We are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. But we also find that that His grace is available. But He giveth more grace. You know what's also wonderful about this grace? Is that it's abundant. Look what the Bible says in Romans chapter number 5. Romans chapter number 5. As Paul speaks concerning the violations of the law, the condemnation of man because of his transgression of the law. The Bible says in verse number 20, he says, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. You know what you and I are? We're offenders. Every last one of us. We're all offenders. We've all offended God. We've broken his law. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Christians, tonight, I think it's important that we just pause in our hearts this evening and thank the Lord for the true grace wherein we stand. The salvation that God has given to us as we repented of our sin and by faith accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior. We were born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the Word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. And now God gives us grace to live for Him. This grace, uh, it's abundant, it's sufficient, it's effectual, and it's available. And you and I can continue living our lives for God, come what may, as we rest and trust completely in Him. And as Peter concludes this, this book, as he, as he ends this letter, he provides us with some very practical lessons concerning our response to the true grace wherein we stand. If you're here tonight and, and you know the Lord is your Savior, God has a plan for you. He's outlined several things for us already. He's dealt with, with relationships uh, with it in our home, in the workplace. Uh, he's... He's talked about how we, how we handle hardship by, as we look to Him by faith and trust in Him because He's in control of all things. Uh, we, you and I, we have hope. The world is dreadfully awful, but you and I have hope as we live our lives, keeping our eyes fixed upon Him, living by faith. But there are three very practical lessons that we learn tonight as it concerns this true grace wherein we stand. I want you to look back in 1 Peter chapter number 5 and note the first lesson that you and I are to learn. And it kind of goes along with everything that God's taught us so far 
in this particular book, it's simply this. We must live for God's glory. We must live for God's glory. Remember, hardship is no excuse for bad behavior. You and I are to live our lives to bring glory and honor to our Savior. Look at what the Word of God says in verse number 10. He says, But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. So don't be in conflict in your mind. Don't allow your heart to be, uh, to be uh, in turmoil concerning the hardships that, that have befallen you. Have your faith settled. Know that you know that you have eternal life, as as John wrote in 1 John chapter number 1. Friends, we must have all of these things settled in our hearts. And as we understand that God is in control, you and I can live our lives by faith in Him. Look what the Word of God says in verse number 11. It says, to Him be glory. To Him be what? Glory. And dominion. Forever and ever. Amen. Do you know why you and I can live for God's glory? Because we know He's in control. Is God in control? The Bible says in verse number 11, to Him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. You know what the word dominion means? It means power and authority. God has power and authority forever and and ever. You know, we just celebrated Christmas. One of the most beloved songs is the Hallelujah Chorus of Handel's Messiah. But much of Handel's Messiah, most all of Handel's Messiah, is Scripture. Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. Friends, Christ is in control. If we are going to live our lives for God's glory, do you know what we must do? Understanding that, that God is in control, we need to learn to take our hands off of it. It's hard, isn't it? Years ago, I heard the story of, a, of an automobile accident. This has been several years ago. There was a man driving a Winnebago motorhome down the interstate. And he got up and he went back and he laid down on the bed. And the vehicle wrecked and crashed and there was a lot of injury. He lived and, and the police asked him, so what were you thinking? Well, he said, I hit the button autopilot. And I got up and I went back to the back. And this man, he was honest. He thought, you know what? I can, I can go back. I can take a nap. I'm set on autopilot. You know what he had done? He had taken his hands off. And because of his error, great danger happened. You know, now, now there's all kinds of sensors on cars. Uh, you, can't, uh, you can't get too close to one without setting off a sensor, you know. You have, how many of your cars have that, that cruise control that, that won't let you tailgate anybody? I don't like that. I like the tailgate, you know. They now have an option on vehicles, like new cars, where it's hands-free. And you can, you can sit there behind the wheel have the cruise control set, and all these sensors will keep your car in the lane. It'll slow down automatically via the radar that's built into the car. It'll speed up. Uh, a friend of mine fell asleep once at, the stop, at a stoplight, and the car, the steering wheel began to vibrate, and it woke them up. It's kind of, it's kind of crazy what, what is going on in automobile industry today, right? I'm, call me old-fashioned, but I have to be in control, right? It's one thing with a car, but it's completely different as it pertains to your life. 
So oftentimes we live our lives like we're driving the car. Pedal to the metal. Tailgating. Getting irritated when people get in our way. Giving the Christian fist as you drive by people, right? <laughs> May I tell you, there's no glory given to God when we live our lives like we're driving the automobile. Who's in control? So oftentimes we want to be in control. I'm going to, I'm going to determine what I do with my life. These are the options that, I'm, that, I have, that I have found and I'm going to weigh all of these options and I'm going to choose what is best for me. And we, we leave God out of it completely. Let me ask you a question. Is God trustworthy? Then why do we behave as if we're Him? God is in control. Let's, let's let go. You've heard this statement. Let go and let God. There's not anything that can come into your life except for God allows it. He says, I know the thoughts that I think toward you. Thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you an expected end. God has a purpose. God has a plan. And we know that all Things work together for good. To them that love God. To them who are the called according to His purpose. And you know what happens, but, but we, we know the verses. Oh, I know that! But we must learn to make the conscious decision to apply that. You see what happens oftentimes when hardship comes, we, we believe in our hearts that we have to fix it, don't we? We've got to, we've got to handle this. Well, what's the problem? Well, you, we tell our kids, hey, if you, have, if you have a problem, come to me, right? We tell our children that, like we can do anything about it. Kids, come to your parents <laughs> if you have hardship. Confide in them, trust in them. And parents, Learn to point your children to the Lord. Because this, 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 He's the God of all grace. But too often times we try to fix it ourselves. And we foul it up. And even if we, in our minds, think we've solved the issue, you know what we've done? We've stolen God's glory. His glory he won't share with, him, with another. For Christians, God is trustworthy. God is able. God is almighty God. God is sovereign. Trust in him. Take your hands off. We live in America. We fly our flags. Don't tread on me. Right? I've got rights, man! Certain in inalienable rights! True. It's inarguable. I mean, we have the Word of God. We, we understand the rights of conscience. We understand what liberty is. But we need to give God glory. We've been taught that we're entitled to things. The only thing I'm entitled to if we want to go to this extreme, is a place the Bible calls hell. That's what I'm entitled to based upon the body of my life's work. 
as a sinful man. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And the Lord has saved us. He's given us grace. He's given us what we don't deserve. He's withheld from us what we do deserve. And now God says, listen, I'm in control of this. This true grace, wherein you stand. Christians, learn to live your life for God's glory. For His pleasure, you are and were created. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Don't react disproportionately. Don't respond in the flesh. Be filled with the Spirit. Live for His glory. Notice the second lesson that we learned tonight. Is that you and I are to live faithfully toward the brethren. Because of this grace... Wherein I stand, this true grace, wherein we stand. The Bible says in verse number 12, by Sylvanus, notice how Paul describes this man. A faithful brother unto whom? Can you answer that question? Unto, Unto whom? Unto you. Let's look there, look there again, verse 12. By Sylvanus, a faithful brother unto... <laughs> Let's try it again. A faithful brother unto you. Who is he faithful to? He's faithful to God's people. Christians, we're in it together. Aren't we? At least we ought to be. And here we have this faithful man. He was faithful. Peter could have said he was faithful unto me. He was faithful unto the Lord. But he says he's faithful unto you. What does it mean to be faithful to one another? Well, the Bible says in Hebrews, look at Hebrews chapter number 10. In Hebrews chapter number 10, in verse number 24, The Bible says, and let us consider one another. Let us consider whom? One another. What does it mean to consider? It means to consider one another. How many? I don't want to be inconsiderate. God wants us to take each other into account, be thoughtful of one another. In other words, how can I be a blessing to you? (laughs) But we're Americans, right? And life is about me. My life is about what I want, and I don't want to be inconvenienced. But Peter describes Sylvanus as a faithful brother to you. And the writer of Hebrews says, let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works. Christians, if you you and I, we need each other. Our responsibility is to each other to provoke one another unto love and good works. What does this mean? I need to be here for you. You need to be here for each other. We are here to help one another grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We're to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. We're to function like a family, not a dysfunctional family, but a fully functional, God-honoring family. We're to be faithful. Faithful to each other. We're to be here for each other. 
in our moments of need, in depths of despair, we're to be there. In times of great joy, happiness, and victory, we're to be there. That's when it's easy to be there, isn't it? When life is good, when everything is smooth sailing, it's easy to be there. The Bible says, the book of Proverbs, that a brother is born for adversity. And there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. How many of you have siblings? Have you ever heard the statement, blood is thicker than water? You know, scientifically that's true. Blood is thicker than water. Practically speaking, when hardship comes, do you know who you have? You have family. You have the Lord, you have your family. But you know what the local church is? It's family. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works. In verse 25, the Bible says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another as you see the day approaching. What day is approaching? Well, it's the day that Peter referenced. It's the, in verse number 10, it says, but the God of all grace who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. The day of the Lord, that's what he's speaking of. The day when our faith becomes sight, when we're ushered from, from this life to eternity. You and I are to encourage each other in the Lord. We're to help one another. Why? You know what we have in common? We may have nothing in common as far as our families are concerned, our upbringing is concerned, hobbies are concerned. But you know what we have in common? We have the Lord Jesus Christ in common. This true grace wherein you stand. And though we may not be re related by, by blood, so to speak, you know, we are related by blood. We're all blood relatives because of the blood of Jesus Christ. And you and I are to be faithful brethren. We see an example here. Look what the Bible says in verse number 12. He says, uh, A faithful brother unto you, as I suppose I have written briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God where you stand. Verse 13 says, The church that is at Babylon elect together with you saluteth you. And so doth Marcus, my son. This man Marcus is believed to be John Mark. This man who in the ministry began with great, with really dismal failure. You know, he set out with with Paul and Barnabas. And there was a, a schism between Paul and Barnabas over John Mark. And the two separated, they went their ways. But you know what happened? He remained faithful. He remained a faithful brethren despite the conflict, despite the hardship, despite petty disagreement he remained faithful so much so at the end of Paul's life Paul referenced him look what the Bible says in Colossians please in Colossians chapter number 4 he speaks of this man in verse number 10 the Bible says Aristarchus my brother my fellow prisoner saluteth you and Marcus Marcus Sister's son to Barnabas, touching whom he received commandments, if he come unto you, receive him. Faithfulness. Moreover, it's required in stewards that a man be found faithful. I want to live my life faithfully for the Lord. And as a result... If I'm living my life faithful for the Lord, faithfully for the Lord, I'm going to live my life faithfully toward you. You and I need each other. You and I need this. What is this? This is the local New Testament church. 
you and I are not one man shows. We need each other. We need to encourage each other. You know what's encouraging? When people come to church and they see you here. Understand that this grace, where we stand, is true. And I'm going to be faithful to my Lord and all that He says. And as a result, I'm faithful to you. Coming to church and being a part of something bigger than me. Something that, that God has ordained to reach the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I live my life faithfully toward you. I'm going to be a help to you. Marcus was a help to Paul. He was a help to Peter. He's a prime example of a faithful brother. So is Silvanus. But notice the final lesson that we learned tonight. It's found in the last verse. We're not going to do the first part of the verse. Greet ye one another with a kiss of charity. The only kiss of charity I'm giving tonight is to my wife. And I hope she returns the favor. But I would like to focus on the word charity. Charity. The final lesson is this. Love the brethren. Don't just be faithful to the brethren. Love the brethren. Greet ye one another with a kiss of charity. Peace be with you all that are in Christ Jesus. Amen. What is this charity? Well, this charity is the selfless, self-giving, self-sacrificing love of Jesus Christ. Peter already referenced this kind of love in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 22. The Bible says, Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. You and I are called of God to love each other. Look what the Word of God says in, in 1 John chapter 3, in verse number 14. It says, we know that we have passed from death unto life. In other words, this is a, a testimony or fruit of our salvation. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Love the brethren. Each of us should occupy a special place in each other's hearts. We're to love each other. What does this love look like? Look at what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians, please. It'd be criminal to reference this love, this charity, this love of the brethren, and not, not look at the, this great chapter of love. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 1, the Bible says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or as tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge and Though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. It doesn't matter how special or great we think we are if we don't love each other like Christ loved us. The Bible says in verse 3, And though I bestow on all my goods and, uh, to feed the poor, and though, I have, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. It doesn't matter what you count good about yourself. If you don't have love for the brethren, Paul says you're nothing. He says, charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not, charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. Doth not behave itself unseemly, speak, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth. The Bible says, but 
Whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a, a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. Notice in verse 13, And now abideth faith, hope, charity. These three, but the greatest of these is charity. You know what? If I love you, my life is not about me. I won't mind being inconvenienced. I won't mind going out of my way to be a blessing. I'm not in it for the praise of man. Not in it for the prize or some reward. Not spiteful. Not hateful. Not arrogant. Because I love the Lord. And as a result, I love you. Charity. Without the true grace wherein we stand, charity means nothing. You and I don't know what love is until we're partakers of the love of God. We don't know what it means to sacrifice until we understand the sacrifice that Christ made on our behalf. We don't know what it means to give of ourselves until we understand that God so loved the world that He gave. We don't understand what it means to be humble until we see the humility of Christ, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as men, he humbled himself became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. We don't know what it means to serve until we understand the service that Christ spent. For the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, to give His life a ransom for many. You know what the Gospel does? Not only does it set us free from the laws of sin and death, which I'm thankful for, by the way. It sets me free from me. Life is no longer about me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The true grace wherein you stand. Christians, it's real. And it's life-changing. It's real and it gives you hope. It's real and it provides you with purpose. It's real, and it helps us understand how we're to live our lives. We're to live for God's glory. We're to live faithfully toward the brethren. We're to love the brethren. All because of the true grace. Wherein you stand. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed.